John Greenleaf Whittier, who was a famous poet in Massachusetts, heard the story of this brave little old lady in Frederick and thought it would make a great subject for a poem. So the next year, 1863, he wrote The Ballad of Barbara Fritchie and published it in the Atlantic Monthly in October of that year. Now, Barbara never met John Greenleaf Whittier, the poet. John Greenleaf Whittier had never been in Frederick um, to witness the event, or not witness the event, as the case may be, but um, the poem became very popular. The original source and reporter of the Barbara Fritchie story was Miss Eden Southworth, who would go on to become the best-selling novelist of the 1800s. She was an outspoken abolitionist and she lived in the Georgetown neighborhood of Washington, D.C. She apparently heard the story from a good friend, a fellow named Cornelius S. Ramsberg, who just happened to be a grandnephew of uh, Barbara Fritchie there living in Georgetown. Well, in late July of 1863, she would uh, tell the story in the form of a letter and send this to John Greenleaf Whittier in Amesbury, Massachusetts. Um, she said within the letter that uh, when hearing this story, she sensed that it seemed to already belong to John Greenleaf Whittier as if it was contained in a book with his name written on the cover. We are here in the Whittier home where he lived for decades, in the very study where he did his writing. According to Roland Woodwell, Whittier's biographer, um, Eden Southworth told Whittier the story of Barbara Fritchie, and she heard it from a neighbor. Whittier was an ardent abolitionist and also a peace-loving Quaker. He wanted to write a poem that was patriotic without being warlike. John Greenleaf Whittier, from my perspective, was um, famous for sentimental poetry and he was what was known as a fireside poet. He wrote poems that often families could read around the fireside and they were often narrative poems and they often celebrated events in, in the lives of ordinary people. And so the poem Barbara Fritchie certainly creates a sentimental view of this little old lady who is so brave that she will wave the flag in defiance of the Confederate troops, which was a very courageous act in those days. The poem is a classic underdog tale, a reminiscent of the Bible story of David and Goliath. Here we have as David, this uh, feeble yet feisty woman in her 90s, and uh, as Goliath, we have none other than General Thomas Jonathan Stonewall Jackson of Virginia, arguably the most famous of the Confederate officers during this period of the, uh, the Maryland Antietam Campaign of 1862. Whittier sent the Barbara Fritchie poem to his publisher, Jamie Field, to appear in the Atlantic Monthly. Fields loved it and also said Barbara Fritchie was worth her weight in gold. The poem was reprinted in many Northern papers and appeared in anthologies. Whittier received fame and $50 for the poem, um, but he also received an invitation to the Saturday Club, which was an exclusive invitation-only club of Boston intellectuals. And the town of Amesbury um, became more well-known in the northeast corner of Massachusetts because that's where Whittier lived. The poem has its own place in American history, written by an abolitionist at a point where the folks in the north were getting pretty wary of this war that they thought uh, was, was going to be over in 90 days, and here it is years later and all these casualties, and, and they're actually seeing photographs of casualties for the first time, and there's been a lot of loss of spirit. And, and so it was really a pep rally uh, in, the, in the middle of this, this great conflict that the poem served that role. It's an example of patriotism and standing up for what you believe. And the fact that it was an older person and a female, I think those are important lessons for people to hear today, children to hear that anyone, young and old, and male or female, could be able to act on their convictions without shame and to act with courage. And it's a patriotic story. It's a story which I think was very popular when it first was published and was heartening to the people in the, sympathetic to the Union. Um, in the North, uh, the poem was, uh, was beloved, a great success, uh, Barbara Fritchie, an overnight superstar. Uh, she received this uh, posthumous glory 
as did her hometown of Frederick, Maryland, uh, which ironically had uh, also served home uh, to another defender of the flag, Francis Scott Key, who wrote the Star Spangled Banner 50 years uh, before the Civil War, during the War of 1812. The poem also uh, did great things for Union morale at this time in the war and also for Union enlistments. So it was, uh, was a true success. In the South, uh, <laughs> Whittier's poem was uh, labeled as Yankee propaganda, an attempt to shame and dishonor their uh, fallen and beloved uh, Stonewall Jackson and also painted the Confederate soldiers as, uh, as barbarians willing to fire, shoot at, uh, at people, civilians, regardless of gender or age. She was born in Lancaster, Pennsylvania in 1766, and when, her, when she was two years old, her parents moved here to Frederick, and Barbara lived in Frederick for the rest of her life. She lived to be 96 years old. And we don't know very much about her childhood, but because she had such a long life, she lived through several major wars in this country. And of course, the first was the American Revolution, and even though she was only a child, she became a great admirer of George Washington. And that was probably where her seed of loyalty and patriotism was born. The records of her church membership show that she was an active member. When the family moved here to Frederick, they quickly took up among the old German reforms in this church, and she then was a lifetime member uh, of this congregation. We don't know very much until she got married, and we know that she was almost 40 when she was married, which was very unusual in those times. And what was even more unusual, the man that she married, John Fritchie, was 14 years her junior. And that tells me that Barbara really did not care that much about what society said was proper or acceptable in those times. After the Revolutionary War, uh, there was a trial held in Frederick, and six locals were sentenced to death for supporting the British. One of those was Barbara Fritchie's father-in-law. Barbara Fritchie's husband spent his life growing up uh, embarrassed in being the son of a traitor who was hung, and from what I read, never wanted to have children because he didn't want them to live through what he lived through, being the son of a traitor of his country. Barbara and her husband presumably accentuated the positive every chance they could get, showing that they were loyal to the United States of America and its government through thick and thin. They wanted to get away from that stigma that had been created by John's father being on the wrong side of the American Revolution. You have to realize that in September of 1862, Barbara is now 95 years old, and she's barely five feet tall, so she really is a little old lady. And we know, of course, that when the Union troops were in town, and the Confederate troops were in town at the same time in September of 1862, when the Union troops were on their way to South Mountain, General Reno was leading those troops. And Barbara stood at the front door and waved the American flag. And apparently General Reno was so impressed with this little old lady that he got down from his horse and came into the house to have a few words with Barbara. And we know that he sat at Barbara's desk and wrote what was probably one of his last letters home because he was killed a couple of days later in the Battle of South Mountain. We have a credible account that Barbara Fritchie did indeed wave a flag at an army of soldiers that passed by her door in September of 1862, to be exact, September 13, 1862. However, this was the Union Army, the army of whom she supported. They had come up from Washington, D.C. under General George McClellan and were in pursuit of Robert E. Lee and his Confederate Army, his Army of Northern Virginia, who had occupied Frederick roughly from September 5th through the 10th. But the Confederates had pulled out of town on the 10th and uh, heading west on Patrick Street, the National Road. 
There are other accounts that, uh, that exist. A woman named Mary Quantrell who lived two blocks west of Barber's house. She was a school teacher and she and her students confronted the Confederates and were waving flags. And uh, there's also an account of a young teenager in Middletown, about eight miles west of Frederick on the National Road, who had uh, done something of the same, confronted the Confederates and a flag was involved. But uh, to this day, we don't have a bona fide account of the legendary heroics of Barbara waving a flag and, uh, at the Confederate Army. When the Confederate troops marched by, again, on their way to the Battle of South Mountain, that's when the incident occurred or did not occur, but that was the incident that made Barbara famous and put Frederick on the map. Now the story is that General Stonewall Jackson was leading the troops to the Battle of South Mountain and Barbara waved the American flag in defiance of the Confederate troops. And apparently one of the soldiers became so upset that here was this woman waving the enemy flag that he took out his rifle and fired a single shot. And according to legend, he did not hit Barbara, but he hit the staff. And before the flag could fall to the ground, Barbara grabbed the flag and continued to wave it in defiance of the Confederate troops. I think when we look at Barbara Fritchie, what we're really seeing almost is the Paul Revere story of Boston in another place. And the reason I say that is we all remember Paul Revere and Paul Revere was a real person. He really did make a ride, even though he didn't actually tell anyone the British were coming because they kind of captured him. And yet we remember him for this ride that he took because of another poem. And yet he was this real person who had a real impact on our country's history as an illustrator, as a silversmith, as a patriot, and all of these other things. And I see the Barbara Fritchie story being very similar to that. Uh, here we have this character that may not have done what, what the poem said she did that was nonetheless a significant character in American history. Whether she did it or not, to me, is kind of immaterial. She was the kind of person who would. And a lot of people testified to that um, in, in the days following her death, including one of my predecessors who was her pastor um, during the Civil War and before. Um, and he said very clearly, um, he wasn't weighing in on the factual side either. He just said that's something that she would have done. Barbara Fritchie as a local person, but more importantly as a bellwether for all of those people that lived in her generation, and there weren't that many left when she died, is the perfect study of what America was and what it would become. And, and she saw that happening in a way we just don't see in very many other individuals. Whether she ever waved a flag at Stonewall Jackson or not doesn't matter. She was an important character in the history of our country because of what she lived through and what she saw. I think by the simple effort of going to the window and maybe waving at a time or two, she wiped away the disgrace and past of the Fritchie name and turned the Fritchie name from a traitor to a hero. I think that the poem resonates today because the writer allows us to, um, to draw our own meaning. You know, it is exciting that Barbara Fritchie lived here in Frederick, that she made her home here. That we know is fact. But the poem lives more in the realm of myth and parable. And, and I think that's um, what helps make it universal for the ages. Some people, simply because of their uh, achievements or their notoriety, one or the other or both, become icons. And she's become that. And uh, people who may not know anything else about Frederick Maryland uh, may know about the poem about Barbara Fritchie. And um, I think because of the poem, uh, the city has, has gained that beautiful uh, picture of the clustered spires of Frederick green walled by the hills of Maryland. You see the hills on either side. You see the clustered spires kind of settling down in the middle. Shoot if you must this old gray head, but spare your country's flag, she said. And it is fairly easy to memorize because it's written in rhymed couplets. 
and rhyming poetry often is much easier to memorize than um, non-rhyming poetry. To this day, we still get people from any English-speaking part of the world above a certain age, I do have to, to point out, uh, back when folks memorized poetry in school, uh, who can still show up and at least do part of the poem and talk about who taught it to them. And, um, and so it's, it's provided a real connection for, for so many folks. While Barbara Fritchie was a, an icon in the literary sense, she also uh, was an icon kind of in the branding sense for Frederick County. There, there are many businesses over the years that have leveraged the Barbara Fritchie name in a way that brings people to the community and brings people into their business. I don't think that in any way diminishes her or her role in history because it's a way that brings people more information about the past, which I think is often helpful in selling products. It certainly has been a huge influence on the booming heritage tourism business here in Frederick County. As the poem was published in the Atlantic Monthly in October of 1863, um, it was an instant sensation and people began coming here to Frederick, the pilgrims to this place where this patriotic hero, this, this woman who defied Confederates, um, you know, made her home. I think everybody's heard the phrase, build it and they will come. With Barbara Fritchie, it was sort of the reverse, that enough people um, knew of the poem that if they had reason to come to Frederick, they would ask about Barbara Fritchie's house, and it was gone for, for decades after a flood destroyed it in 1868. And the early 20th century, a group of local business folks uh, said, you know, enough people come and ask about Barbara Fritchie, we ought to build her house back. And so the, uh, I think, slightly smaller scale version of it, uh, supposedly using some of the original materials, uh, got reconstructed because of the fact that, that she put Frederick on the map, the poem put Frederick on the map, for many, many decades. When Winston Churchill was uh, Prime Minister of England and he came to uh, the United States to visit then President Franklin Roosevelt, they went to what is today Camp David. In those days it was called Shangri-La. And on the way back from Shangri-La, Winston Churchill asked if they could stop by the Barbara Fritchie House in Frederick. And in those days, of course, they went by car. They didn't go by helicopter. And so they stopped here at the Barbara Fritchie House. And the story is that Winston Churchill stood right out on the sidewalk in front of the house and recited the entire poem uh, from memory because he had studied it as a boy in England. And that's my favorite story about this house. She is literally the personification of who this town was during her lifetime. Um, she is a woman, quite frankly, in, in some ways very much of her time, and in other ways I think possibly a little bit ahead of it. She is a person that bridges two of the most important uh, uh, historical events in our country from the American Revolution and uh, the American Civil War. And more importantly, she lived the life that this town provided. She lived a life in a town that it, her birth was on the edge of the frontier and by the time of her death was part of a well-anchored country that went all the, way to the, all the way to the Pacific Coast. We can't, I think, make enough of that kind of a, of a history because that's the story of Frederick. And she is the story of Frederick. Frederick isn't the same without her and she isn't the same without it.